Do I have any salt on jade eggs? Yes, of course I do. <laughs> it's not that I'm anti kegels. I think kegels are overrated or, or over prescribed, right? I don't think that everybody needs to do kegels. Um, I think it has really more to do with how tight is your pelvic floor uh, customarily and how do you work against that right so that you don't wear out your pelvic floor uh, it's also been found out you can look it online you know, there's lots of uh, research on that uh, is that squatting is way better than kegels way better because it actually works with the whole pelvic floor um, and gives you a nice ass while you're at it <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, you know, just body weight squats, you know, just, you know, and, and going down in a squat or things of that nature are much more effective because they actually work with the whole pelvic floor. So as far as jade eggs go, um, as you know, probably there's several rings of muscles vaginally. And then, of course, there's other muscle groups that make up the pelvic floor. Um, it's, it's an interesting practice to do uh, in order to have um, articulation of those rings of muscle vaginally. You know, depending on whom you believe, that's, you know, of utmost support, uh, you know, importance for great sex. And then other people say, well, there's really other things also to consider. So I would say try it, right? Um, I certainly did a, a, you know, a whole bunch of that stuff. Uh, jade eggs and other things uh, as a way to learn what there is to learn about that particular area. And so I think it's very useful um, to um, get acquainted, you know, with all the muscles and, and, and rings and the cervix and the G-spot and all the things that can be, uh, one can be acquainted with. Um, that's not only true, true vaginally, I think your whole body you should get really well acquainted with as an instrument of life, you know, the, the only body you have there, but also pleasure, you know. And um, uh, the, the same attitude for me applies there as it applies everywhere else. If you're doing it because you somehow think it's going to make you a more valuable human being that somehow gets you a better man, that somehow gives you better support or better sex, it's just it's it's a it's a losing battle because the tightest most well articulated vagina doesn't give you a, a better man necessarily right or a better life or more happiness uh, those things are not quite as easily equatable so um while i'm very very much for practicing with these things i think that there are other things to cultivate that trump um perfect articulation of your pussy, no, personally. It's not to say one shouldn't have good articulation in that, in that realm, but um, um, the way I was taught by my teacher was certainly less technical, more devotional, mm. uh, and less, um, you know, less performance sport and, and more heart, so to speak. So I think you have to find the, the balance of why are you doing it. Now, Steve's not here for this one, but um, you know he speaks very eloquently about the hook sharpening. You know that a lot of women come to women's workshops, or all, not only women's workshops, but also women's workshops, to sharpen their hooks so that they can hook into a man better, and uh, that the you know the feeling is a bit like oh well if I learn this then it's going to be okay. Uh, and you know, people go to Tony Robbins for the same reason, or whoever. I'm not singling him out. It's just the best known, you know, self-help guru. Ultimately, that's not making a difference. Right? Mm -hmm. Ultimately, um, you know, the, the perfect sexual technique is not going to make you happy. Uh, there's a lot more to to deal with. That said. Um, a good quality jade egg is a fun thing to have mm -hmm. <laughs> and play with. And uh, uh, I would highly recommend one wears a good and a sturdy underwear while employing such tools during uh, the summer months. 
<laughs> That's all I'm going to say on that subject. <laughs> Particularly when one has a cold or a hay fever. <laughs> It's a Taoist uh, practice tool okay. in, the, in, the, in, the, in a very ancient sense where you have the egg with the, you know, the, the, the hook and the thing and you learn how to move that thing all the way up and then move it all the way back down and then eventually you can put uh, weights on there and all kinds of shit, right? So, so it's a, it's a, you know, the Taoists were very big on um, that very, very technical stuff and so that's what it's really for, of course. Anything eventually gets appropriated by the uh, whatever the yonis of the world, um, and there's nothing wrong with the yonis of the world. But it's not as easy as you stick a jade egg up, right. and suddenly your past lovers are cleared. Right, uh, right. That would be nice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think to add to that, um, the very ugly truth. In, in the realm of somatics, of course, is that whomever you combine yourself with, you exchange with good, bad, and ugly, right? And when you exchange sexually with someone, the act of actually physically opening your body and letting somebody breach the, 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 the physical hull, so to speak, right? But also the energetic, psychic, um, you know, finer realm certainly you're letting somebody enter uh, psychically, emotionally, physically. And even biologically, right, we now know that if a man ejac ejaculates in you, you actually have cells of that man within you for the rest of your life, you know, as you have cells of your children, if you have any, even if you're bored uh, in you for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. So from all different kinds of levels, uh, the consideration of pollution, so to speak, psychic pollution, is very real. And anybody who's ever been very deeply entered emotionally, physically, spiritually by somebody knows that the absence of that person causes a, a void. Right? And that void, so to speak, has the shape of that person. I'm talking about the void in the heart of having opened yourself. But if it's a violent act, it's even worse because then it's a traumatic uh, imprint. That's sadly not exactly a void. It's like a, you know, a, a stamp of something. But it's the same kind of a concept is that you uh, willingly or unwillingly gave um, up something, were penetrated maybe against your will, or uh, at will, really opened yourself up and then that person leaves. And probably almost anyone has experienced that feeling of really, really having uh, opened to a man and that man no longer being around and that having been the deepest uh, experience there was so far, even though there were other men after. And still the, the, that orientation towards the deepest imprint and the fantasy towards the deepest imprint and the ache of that deepest imprint on removing an imprint of someone, which you can do. It's very hard work, and how you do it is you replace the imprint of a man with the imprint of God, which requires huge amounts of uh, devotional practice, but it can be done. That I know for a fact, out of experience, that you can essentially reshape the void into a God-shaped void, so to speak, where you, you can enter with God that way. But I think that as women, we have the tendency to A, want, and B, uh, you know, invite that deepest imprint because it gives us direction. It gives us orientation. It allows us to, um, you know, attach in a certain way. And so I don't think y once, you've, once you've started being sexually active in one way or another, that imprint, that strong imprint, is what you orient towards. You know. So that said, if you, that's why I'm saying the horrible truth is, if you are an ex-sports fucker, so to speak, right? You had, you had your, you know, you had your time of sports fucking or you had the kind of involvements, you know what I mean by that, right? <laughs> yeah. 
we've all done it at some point, right? Um, and or or you you've been with a few men who left deep imprints because they were very dominant, but they were also real assholes. You're going to have to do more than a JDAG. And even if you're not sexually active, women report that just regular life uh, essentially creates tension in the vaginal area, creates tension around the cervix. And that even if you're relatively clear in your sexual conduct and you like, let's say you have a regular partner and all of those kind of things, uh, you will accumulate tension in those areas. And you certainly accumulate psychic imprints and psychic gunk and injuries and all kinds of stuff, not only vaginally, but in the heart and, and everywhere else. So I'd say that the ritual there or the belief of the ritual and the intention there is more important than the actual technique or the kind of egg or whatever, because, you know, your guess is as good as anybody's. Is it working? Does jade have cleansing properties? Supposedly, yes. And you'll see in every uh, really good Korean spa, you have a jade room, which I'm crazy about. And, uh, you know, but it's, it's, not, it's not as clear cut as take this, be cleansed of all your bad sexual experiences. But... I think the um, the thing we know now uh, to bring it a little bit out of the you know realms of the woo woo into the very practical is epigenetics. I don't know if you know about epigenetics, right? Epigenetics, just so that you know, is essentially they've now found out that on the outside of the DNA there's these methylene chains that actually store traumatic information through generations. So even though you didn't inherit them in the DNA, they attach to your DNA, and so you have the traumas of your grandmother and great-grandmother. And of course, most people, um, just from the last couple of hundred years, and even before, had very violent pasts, particularly World War I and World War II, and you know, all kinds of other uh, atrocities all over the world. You have that in your, in your makeup, uh, that's all, that's as it's as important as the DNA. It's just not in the DNA. The interesting thing about epigenetics is that they've discovered that the thing that al- you can alter the methylene chains, versus you cannot really alter DNA. And this, uh, the experiment, of course, with you know pharmaceuticals, because how else can you make money? But the people who are not into the pharmaceuticals have found out that essentially pretty much any shamanic ritual cleanses the epigenetic information, right? So shamans, proper shamans, not the uh, San Francisco Bay Area variety, you know, and, and, and proper, you know what I'm talking about. Um, you do not want to get a shamanic treatment at Burning Man or something like that, right? There's proper people who have proper lineages and proper educations and also proper medicinal plant use, right, which is another thing. If, you know, mushrooms, for instance, magic mushrooms, have, uh, have been proven in many, many experiments to actually alter PTSD patterns and things like that. So has pot, uh, ecstasy, MDMA, pure grade uh, MDMA is also being experimented with, with war veterans um, and, and people of, uh, who had uh, sexual assault. So there is there's botanical chemical and shamanic rituals that actually um, take the trauma and cleanse the trauma of the methylene chains. So this is where proper shamanism and science actually agree on something, you know, or come together. So that all said, if you feel that there's things you must heal or remove or cleanse from your system, uh, a, a good shamanic ritual, so to speak, is probably your best bet with all the the available information and ritual that's available there. You know, if you can find somebody who really knows what they're doing, even the better. But I think uh, intention and uh, availing oneself of the really ancient techniques, everything from saging to drumming and stomping the feet and you know tribal dancing and rituals and all of those kind of things can only be good when they are free of the the the, the hook to you know pay somebody's rent of course 
In my tradition, devotional practice is literally the learning, um, the, the, the ability to merge with a deity, become the deity, and then eventually, once you know how to become the deity, become one with the deity, um, which also is a practice that exists in Vajrayana uh, tantric traditions. Guru yoga is a similar thing, right? Where you merge with a deity or, or, or a guru to the point where you and the, the deity are one. And then from there, you can merge with a, with a man who can also do that. And then that's considered what they call the great marriage in Tantra. Maituna is what they call it. Where you are no longer human beings having sex your god and goddess, so to speak, combining in complete emptiness slash fullness uh, into dissolution, all of that kind of good stuff that one likes to enjoy when one can, right? But that, that takes something, and that's the reason I call it a devotional practice is that it really requires your heart to be available for that merge, now, not everybody wants to learn proper deity yoga. Uh, it's very time intensive and very uh, vigorous and certainly brings up all your shit. Some of the ladies in here have done a round in a, in a long, long-term long women's group um, and that's you know the first step of it. But the act of um, opening your heart to something greater than a human, uh, even if you see God in your man, so to speak, but that's a bit tricky because, you know, um, it's usually not as clean um, as when you do it with the manifestation, your person. You could merge with a tree. You could, um, you know, merge with Shiva. You could, uh, uh, any archetype will really do. Uh, it's done in many traditions in many different ways where your heart uh, gets the imprint of God, so to speak, and the, com the combining with God and where you first merge and then polarize w with God um, as, a, as a form of um, devotional practice. Right? But devotional practice could be sweeping. My yeah. teacher, for the first two years of my uh, apprenticeship, I did nothing else but sweep and make tea. Sweep and make tea, tea and sweep, sweep and tea. Then uh, I learned how to wash the dishes in a devotional thing and so on and so on so till I got to the more artful things the, the sacred movement and the chalk painting and all the other things I learned over the years I was like three four years in oh. and eventually you come to the place where everything you do is essentially a, a, in the service of the divine however you know however you understand that oh. So that that's a that's a long-winded answer to can you cleanse <laughs> your your karma with a with a with a jade egg? Yeah. There's two way you two ways you can go at it. You can identify the problem, which is my man does not give me what I need, and how do I get him to give me what I need? Right. So if we stick with that, there's different approaches you can apply. So one approach is do this and see what happens, right? And do this is essentially a semi-prescribed, it's a semi-prescribed set of circumstances that works based on dynamics that um, will probably give you the results you want. And that's great. But that makes you essentially just a female pickup artist. Well, if I'm very, very brutal about it. Because you're using manipulative techniques to get what you want for your own gain. Right? So that's fine. Sometimes one needs that. Right? And the guy who's never uh, been able to approach a girl uh, is going to have to learn. And by the way, there's really good, so to speak, pickup. You know, uh, people who who've done incredible work on empowering men uh, and giving them freedom through the ability to deal with women properly. But for every one of those guys, there's guys who've just uh, figured out how women work and that when you treat them with this slight negative thing, they do something and they're competitive, so they do something and they have a social pecking order. So you can use that and so you can get a girl by essentially pushing all the right buttons. Very popular, 
you wouldn't necessarily want to be with a guy like that, mm -hmm. right? But the other way around isn't much better, uh, meaning if you learn a set of circumstances that you use solely so that your needs are being met, you're, you're essentially a parasite, yeah. right? There's no other way of saying that. Now, you could go, okay, I have needs, I want to learn how to make my needs known, and I also take responsibility for the fact that they are my needs and that imposing them on my man might be okay with him, but it might not be. Mm -hmm. right? So you take self-responsibility versus the tool to get the thing, which is the hook. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, most people really like hooks because it keeps them in this nice codependent clench where they get to just, I give you yours, you give me mine. Right. So a lot of exercises are designed so you learn the ways that you can get a guy to give you what you want. And then you get that, hopefully, and then you want the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing, because it never ends. Your demand or your need, if it's not filled from the inside out, will be endless. Right. So that's the bigger picture on what to consider. If you would like to learn those kind of tools, there's plenty of people out there who will give you those tools and they will be good enough that you, you, you feel a moment of relief and then you'll have to come back for the next set of tools. Right. Now that's not to say that I don't teach some of these things as well because principles are principles mm -hmm. and there are certainly ways to talk with a man and be with a man and respect the man in a way that has much better results. Um, can you learn techniques to get what you want? Absolutely. Are they being taught all over the place? Absolutely. It's a short-term solution. And because women have an expiration date, so to speak, right? sexually speaking, not in any other way, but sexually, reproductively speaking, if you waste a lot of time on getting lots of skills to hook the right guy in the right kind of situation, it might work but it also might not work. And then there comes a moment where you'll have to do the other thing anyway, which is figure out why you have that need and why you somehow need to have a guy fill that need. And then you can come from a place of um, offering that very thing instead of taking it. And then you have yourself a whole other set of circumstances. Because, right? for instance... Um, the, the thing that we want, we can't have because we don't have it. So, so meaning it's a little bit like you don't have a receptor for that very thing that you want so badly because it was missing in your childhood. Right? So if you've been abandoned, you're going to want a man to be there for you completely. But your imprint, your first imprint of love, of course, is that love comes in the form of abandonment. So you're actually not going to be really happy one subgroup of you will not be really happy till you've been abandoned, which you equate with love. So it becomes a total utter mindfuck because you're going to now try and get the guy to not abandon you. But when he actually doesn't abandon you, it doesn't feel right mm -hmm. because that's not the, the, the key that turns the lock that is your particular love disposition. Right. So it becomes very tricky when you need a guy to be a certain way. It's much more, and this is one of the things that I'm very intent on these days particularly, it's much more important, I personally think, that you have good discrimination and you know whom you are getting with and that you don't get with a guy where you have to... Now, I'm not talking about the articulation of basic needs amongst two adult human beings, right? That's fairly straightforward. I need you to put the toilet seat down. Well, I like to leave the toilet seat up because if I'm in the middle of the night and, you know, I don't want to piss on the rim of the toilet seat. Okay, but when I come out into the bathroom in the middle of the night, you know, all what happens. So we must find a compromise, right? That's what basic, basic human adult behavior is and that's true for 
more deeper relational and sexual things. So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the sexual dynamic of penetrating and surrendering, going and flowing, uh, being and doing. And in that domain, your best chance is to be able to assume the position that you would like to assume. You're much better off acquiring a solid set of skills and solid set of of in-the-body practices like we're doing here so that your body can assume the posture of surrender. So instead of going, oh, when he says this, I say this, and then I do this, and then, you know, he will do this, that works maybe. It only works once or twice, right? But if your body can assume the asana, you know, the posture of surrender readily and easily because it's not the first time you've done it and the rest of the time you're, you know, then the pol- the polarization happens naturally. And then you will also attract the man who wants to organize you. The problem is often that women have a good idea that they want to surrender, but they're really not surrendering because why? Right? The, the guys aren't that great to surrender to, so you run your own thing. Now you have this idea you want to learn how to surrender. Now you try to make a guy who isn't material for that the guy who surrenders you. You, learn, you teach him all these skills somehow you know, through magic and disposition and whatever so he penetrates you deeply and he goes to the man's group and the worst guy you ever want to date is a guy who does this kind of work just so that you know right because he's clearly not capable of doing it yet and we'll also have to do lots of work on that so you want to have somebody who's been down that road for a while or doesn't need to be down that road because they're naturally such inclined and then you're trying to make this guy into the strong masculine man that you desire and then he will penetrate you and it will all be fine. Uh, But you could also just have that kind of disposition and with that disposition call in the kind of guys who would like to organize you, so to speak, penetrate you. Um, But those guys, they're not up for a fight. They're not up for a fight. And You know, in my other life, in one of my many other lives, I consult with very, very uh, powerful men mostly. I I have two women right now, but the rest are all men who are famous, wealthy, powerful, uh, accomplished, smart, good-looking, blah, blah, blah. Those guys don't bother with a woman who has to constantly test him. That's a myth. Right? That's one of the big myths that I'm no longer buying into because I've seen it over and over and over and over. Those guys can't be bothered with a chick who throws up a fight at every moment because she needs to test her man unconsciously or consciously. You, know, you get one chance, you straighten your shit out, you go to a therapy, you take, therapist, you take care of what needs to be taken care of, and then you are there to play. Because really powerful men in all domains, doesn't have to be wealthy, but real powerful men know about energy conservation, and energy preservation. You know, same way, if a guy goes and he learns how to withstand a woman's anger and he gets more and more traumatized because now he can breathe while she screams at him, but he's long checked out, you're going to find yourself with a guy who becomes more and more numb while you become more and more angry because he's more and more numb. Uh, so all of these things each have to be taken in the uh, context of personal responsibility and wholeness, in the context of somatic, meaning bodily ability and willingness to surrender. So softening, relaxing, opening, uh, being available in the body, the mind will follow, right? The mind's quick to say, yes, I will surrender. The body is what goes, fuck no. Right? And then the discrimination of picking the kind of guy who's actually capable. Uh, you know, most women like to pick a good project. And you don't ever want to pick a project. Because of the lineage and because of a few other factors is that 
I've kind of dedicated the rest of my career, so to speak, this, to giving people an actual solid education versus just uh, giving them a workshop where they leave all happy and then those skills don't stick because there's no underpinning or, or understanding of the principles. So they have to come back over and over and over and over. Yeah, it's one of the reasons I'm doing a teacher training this year so that people actually understand the underpinnings of what's happening and they can actually use it. And education becomes the goal and not state experience. Because yeah. state experience, you have to, you know, it's like drugs. And as, as it is with drugs, you'll need more and more and more and more of it. And a really, really, really deep man is pretty damn dead. Right, pretty damn empty. Um, and what makes you then valuable as a sexual partner is that you're pretty damn full of life. And that your body is able to conduct huge amounts of life force at all times and is hugely resonant and, and responsive in that way. And that all tantric traditions have in common, right, that principle. But you won't know till you've done it and then you own it. So instead of just going, well, move in front of your guy, and if you dance sexy, then he'll be attracted. Be radiant is, is, the, is the buzzword. Well, what the fuck does that mean, right? Pring, put a little bit of makeup on, you know, a little bling in the teeth or something like that. Radiance comes from inner wholeness, right? And it comes from life moving through you, and then looks and age are not that important, which is important because most of us want to have relationships long beyond our fertile years. And so the radiance has to come from, from a different place than your actual you know, being, like your, your physical being. So uh, there is real principles of polarity, and the only way you can learn them is by doing it and then figuring out your your radiance, what brings on your radiance. Because otherwise you'll, you'll, you know, you'll be a glorified stripper, so to speak. Right? You just do the thing that one does, and you look around the room and everybody does the same writhing motions. You're like, okay, I guess that's the, what, the, what the cool girls do, so I'll do that too. And there's no integrating who you are as an offering to that man. No. So... But there is real skill on how to communicate with a man without castrating him. That's not what I'm talking about. You know, I'm, I'm talking about the, the prescription f for the hook or the real acquisition of uh, a knowledge that can be used anywhere. You know, that, to me, are the big differences. Um, I was saying this a little bit earlier in response to people saying they were uncomfortable sitting, right? Barely ever do you find optimal conditions, right? If you wait till you're perfectly healed and whole and complete uh, and all the cushions are arranged properly and the lighting is good and you had the right food and you had the green juice and this <laughs> and that, you're probably never going to get to a good relationship, right? It's just not going to happen. And as you know, in some of, I don't know if you know this, in some of the tantric traditions, they have the agoris where you go out into the, into the charnel grounds, you know, where they, bur where they burn the dead and you do the practices there which is about the most uncomfortable and stinky and horrendous thing that one can, da can do, right? So the um, ability to be with what is and still connect both from a heart and sexually with another human being is um, something one can cultivate and should cultivate. Where I personally, because I have so many years of counseling experience, when I spend 20 years, five days a week, eight hours a day counseling people, is that you cannot conflate healing and sexual polarity or tantra or, or things like that. Now, lots of people do it. There's whole strains of Western tantra where it's all about healing sexual trauma. But the issue with that, of course, is that 
if you if you have issues that need to be healed and you are hoping that they will heal in the relationship you're entering the kind of relationship where you're essentially in the convalescent home and you're hoping that between the two of you on three legs you can make it somewhere right and you create the kind of relationship that's um based on the pursuit of that healing which is very beautiful and certainly very helpful it's not exactly sexually exciting right and you become each other's therapists and doctors and healers now some people really like that and that's what they're up for and then that's a good way to go so healing and uh in that kind of full on sexual you know it doesn't have to be intercourse sexual but the psychosexual dynamic uh don't really match that well because one essentially requires that you go beyond your personal preferences not in a way where you violate yourself that's the other problem right that happens a lot in in the tantric circles uh but in a way that you take the bigger picture into um you know into account and you see the other person as god so to speak uh instead of me 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 give me give me give me give me or i murder myself for you you know i'll i'll go beyond my boundaries so that we can be it's neither of those it's a mutual service to something greater oh. so one of the big dangers of people trying to heal each other via the sexual route is that often they're just spiritualizing that particular injury and we in acting in spiritual ways the original perpetration right? that happens a lot and there's whole schools tantra schools that are built on the belief that you have to push to your very edge and then beyond and that's where you grow it's like taking somebody into full pigeon and sitting on their back because they must go to their edge right many people have experienced that kind of stuff in india and are now crippled i mean you probably know how many yoga teachers in their 50s and 60s have had both of their hips and both of their knees replaced and are you know limping along uh because you can't do that kind of violence to your body and the same is true for the sexual body barely ever is taking yourself beyond the edge to think to do certainly not how i live my life and i don't think uh we're doing any woman just justice or a service or any man justice or a service to uh support that kind of belief that's the 50s yeah right it's just the spiritual version of the 50s or the tantric version of the 50s right it's essentially the the, the realms of tantra and polarity and all of those things were meant for the sexual occasion right the sexual occasion including the erotic tension between a man or, and a woman being in a sexual relationship not just intercourse right. but outside of that it's not necessary now well it's very irritating because you're not a stepford wife in the 50s and you're not a woman in northern india in 2000 before you know christ <coughs> you have a whole life that includes all aspects uh, if we talk about the masculine and feminine in each human being right you you have both you wouldn't be able to live if you wouldn't have both because if you just live in your feminine you'd never even make it up here right because you couldn't you couldn't get here without you know all the stuff that that would entail so of course you are capable of running your own life you have been capable of running your own life long before he came along yeah. and you were probably capable of running your own life before your husband came along mm-hmm. so to to suddenly go well i must surrender all of this to a man to his guidance because only then do we have strong sexual polarity which is what i really want isn't exactly right because most women these days in this particular domain not in all of 
the world and in all countries and stuff. But most women these days, in this circle uh, of of uh, in this sphere, are perfectly empowered and capable of doing pretty much anything themselves, mm -hmm. and should. I think it's very healthy that you can, and. Most men these days don't want to be responsible for everything, mm -hmm. right? I mean, who has time on top of everything that they are doing to run a woman's life in the in the complexity as it exists? Mm -hmm. Now, like I said, uh, two thousand years ago in a hovel in northern India, a woman had no say, means, rights, or anything. So that that this wasn't an issue, right? Um, if you practiced tantra. You know, in, in India 2,000 years ago, it was solely about the sexual thing because there wasn't anything else. You were subordinate to a man every which way. But that's thankfully not where we are these days. We're not even in the 50s anymore. You don't have to wait at home in your nice little outfit with your tray of cake till your man comes home. Uh, you can if you want to, but you no longer have to. Yeah, that's that's not, thing. and that's a different thing. Now, is it nice to do those things? I think so. Would I like to run my life a little bit less than I do? Absolutely. But that comes from a place of being utterly capable of managing every aspect of my life. Mm -hmm. Only issue is that sexually, you, as I, as probably every woman in this room, doesn't want to be the one making all the decisions and doing all the things. So... The danger is that if you are running every aspect of your life all by yourself all the time, your body mind is um, has the shape of that independent woman. Mm -hmm. And if you wouldn't, which you are, because you've done this for many years, right? But if you wouldn't, you would be somewhat calcified in that shape. Mm -hmm. And that shape doesn't, like I was saying to Laura, that shape doesn't invite penetration or, or or is able to surrender in the sexual domain mm -hmm. so uh, the only reason why people say things like you have to surrender to the guy at all times is because they don't understand that if you practice those dispositions you can kind of switch back and forth between capable and utterly helpless so to speak for the sexual domain mm -hmm. uh, and then you have a choice in the matter so you can run your whole business and everything by yourself. And then when it's time to engage with the man of your choice in the way you choose to, you can soften and relax and open. And you have the disposition of surrender. And you allow him in that context to be the one guiding the thing. So somebody who is not um, that invested in manipulating you to his will and isn't that invested in a relationship that they would bend over for you, is probably capable of saying, look, don't do this. Yeah. And you go, but I know better than better, than, but I've done this all my life. And, nah, nah, nah. and there's a pretty good chance that he probably sees something that you don't see. But of course you don't just trust that and roll over. You trust it somewhere, you see how that turns out. If it turns out well, well, the next time you're about to kick off about, uh, you can, you're a strong, independent woman, you think twice about it and you take that into account. Yeah. Right? And then there's a dynamic that happens, doesn't even have to be sexual, meaning you don't have to have sex with that you know, man at that particular moment in time, but there's a dynamic where something in you can relax. And you don't have to do everything by yourself because somebody's got your back. No. So this is, once again, a cheap uh, substitution for this is your tennis teacher or your yoga instructor or something like that. So I, that's why women go for that because that's somebody who somehow knows something about you that you can't see as easily. And you trust their expertise and you kind of lean back into them. And that's very, very sexu sex sexually attractive. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, of course, your tennis instructor, you know, might have a whole lot of life outside of your tennis court. But the same applies to a, to a very good man, it's where eventually something in you can relax. You know, because 
somebody's got your back, not in the do this, stand here, wait, you know, but in a, in a much deeper way of seeing a much bigger picture.